So if you've spent much time around my channel or really anywhere that people talk about music, you'll notice pretty quickly that there's a lot of criticism around the whole concept of music theory. People will say it's a waste of time, it's too technical, you know, it will hurt your creativity, um, and that you'll, you'll just wind up following all these rules when you're trying to create music. Now this is something I've wanted to talk about for a long time, and I, I think that there's really two uh, key issues or key arguments on that side of things. One is that I've certainly seen this happen. There are plenty of people who learn their scales and chords and all this stuff, and they really do have a hard time being creative. I remember when I was in college, I had this professor who was an amazing violinist, an incredible performer, and she, she had studied theory her whole life and taught theory classes and everything. And I remember asking her, like, hey, what have you written or what kind of music do you write? She says, oh, no, no, I, I don't write music. I never have. I'm terrible at it. I, I, I can't do it. And I remember thinking, at the very least, that's interesting. Um, but worst case, that's actually really worrisome. I mean, I'm here at school under the impression that learning all about music is going to make me a better musician. But if it didn't work for her, at least in the creating music sense, then why am I even here? Um, and then the second big issue is that there are certainly tons of people out there, musicians, who have never studied theory, certainly not formally, and they're fantastic musicians. They make some of the world's best music. So how, how do you explain that? So I, I want to give you my insights on this stuff and hopefully help you think about the way you approach music, whatever your particular thought process might be. And I, I think the place to start is by thinking about how a four-year-old approaches writing music. If you ever get a chance to watch a four-year-old do anything, you can learn a lot because they, they have no prior experience or anything. They're going to approach things in the most natural way possible. I mean, they, they've just gained consciousness. They have nothing to go on. So here's how a four-year-old will write music. And I've seen this many times. I used to teach lots of kids. But they will, they'll go to the piano or whatever instrument they're on, and they'll just choose a note. They'll just pick one that they think looks good. So they'll pick that one. They'll play it, and they'll listen to it, and they'll decide if they like it or not. And if they don't, they'll try a different one, and they'll keep going until eventually they find a note that they do like. And that's the first note in their song. And then they'll move on to the second note, and they'll repeat the same process. They'll just guess, and they'll play random things until they find a note that they like. And now they have two notes in their song and they'll just keep doing that until they've strung together this, this little melody. Now I can tell you firsthand, sometimes this works really well. I have seen kids write stuff where I'm like, dang kid, kind of wish I'd thought of that. Like it, it can work really well. And, and that is, that's the essential process of writing music. And it, really the essential process of creating any kind of art. There's two steps. There's the idea generation part, just thinking up of something that you want to try, and then the judgment part, where you listen to that thing and you decide if that, that works or not. Now, in the kid scenario, a kid is really good at part two, their, their judgment part. Because if you think about what you're really doing, all you're doing is you're exposing your brain to something. You're listening to a sound and you're trying to see if your human mind responds to it in a way that's positive or not. You know, are the neurons in your head lighting up? And if you had an fMRI machine, you could actually see this. You could see those parts of your brain, you know, firing and, and lighting up. And that's all you're really trying to do. And because this kid has no bias, no experience, no nothing, they're very in tune with that. They just play something and they see if they like it or not. And they're fantastic at this judgment part. But the, the part one, the idea generation part, they're pretty terrible at. You know, they have no concept of what notes are likely to sound good together and what aren't. They're really just choosing things completely randomly. Uh, you know, they're, they're like a random number generator or something. So they're very bad at that. And that is what limits them a lot. You know, like I said, they can come up with a really cool little melody, but... They, I've never seen a four-year-old write some incredible symphony or something because 
as the complexity of what you're trying to do grows, like it gets exponentially harder to just randomly choose things and see if they work. Uh, and that's the case for a lot of musicians starting out. A lot of people, you know, after playing for a few months are able to write, you know, a really cool riff or a cool little progression or something, but they have a much, they have a much harder time expanding that into a full-blown song with sections that make sense and like a, the, the bigger picture part is very difficult for them. So anyway, if you left that kid there um, and they, they kept playing around, they would eventually start to figure stuff out. You know, they'd start playing two notes together and they would start to notice stuff. They'd notice that if you play, you know, two notes that are right next to each other, it sounds not great. It sounds kind of sour. You know, they usually don't like that sound. And they'll notice that if you play notes that are farther apart, you know, they sound a lot nicer. And they'll even get more specific and notice that, you know, if you play notes that are exactly this far apart, it sounds kind of sad. You know, I had a, had a girl tell me once that, you know, this sounds like when Bambi's mom died, which I thought was really heavy for a four-year-old. But, you know, they'll notice that this is a little bit happier and, and whatever. And they'll start to make these little connections and recognize things that they like and things that they don't, and they'll start to see these patterns. And if you left a kid there playing around for 10 or 15 years or something, eventually they get really good at this. You know, their ability to come up with ideas and, and predict what's going to sound good and what's going to fit together would start to develop hugely. They'd, they'd build into bigger things like chords and chord progressions and, you know, melodies and harmonies and all this kind of stuff. And eventually they'd become a really great musician. And that's how you wind up with people that have not studied theory formally that are great musicians. They've done this. They've sat there and they've just discovered things on their own. They've started to identify different sounds and patterns and whatever, and they become a great musician and write great music. Now, the, the difference with something like theory, you know, when you teach someone music theory, all you're doing is you're just showing them this stuff. You're saying, look, this is a minor second, and this is a minor third, and it has this sound attached to it, and this is a fifth. And you'd work into things like the different types of chords and scales and all these other, you know, higher level theory concepts. And you would just be showing that stuff to this kid, you know, stuff that they would have eventually figured out on their own. So you can kind of imagine that as you're trying to develop your your ability to create music, you have these two paths that you can walk. You can go down the experimental path where you just try things and discover everything on your own, or you go down what I'll call the guided path where someone is there, like me perhaps, telling you that, you know, this sounds this way and this sounds like this and here's this pattern and whatever. That's what I'd call the guided approach. Now, there are huge pitfalls and issues you run into either direction you take. And we'll start with the, the guided approach one. One of the biggest problems, and this is what I was saying earlier, that you know some people learn theory and they wind up not being able to create music, is that it's very easy when someone is teaching you things to let what you're being taught interfere with the step two part of writing music. Remember, music is this two-step process. You have the idea generation part. You're trying to you know, identify things that you think are going to work and sound good. And then you have the judgment part where you're just listening to something and literally seeing if that sound lights up the neurons in your head. And when someone is there saying, you know, here's your key, these are the notes that fit in your key, this note does not belong to your key, it's very difficult to not start developing this bias where you, you, you're playing something, you play a note, and you think, ah, that, that doesn't work because it's not in my key. And you're not actually listening to it and just seeing if your, you know, your brain is reacting to it. You're, you're actually letting this bias come in where you're thinking, ah, oh, it's the wrong note. And more often than not, it's not even a conscious process. You're not literally thinking this, it's just kind of leaked into your, to your head somehow. And that's a very difficult thing to have to deal with when you're learning with, like I said, the, the guided approach. And to make it worse, there's plenty of teachers. And I have, I've done this before. It's, it's a very easy thing to kind of slip up and do, but plenty of teachers will present things as if there is this, here's how you should do it and here's how you shouldn't. 
So that's the, the first major issue with what most people think of when they're learning music theory. Now, on the other hand, that's not very likely to happen if you're taking the experimental approach. If you're just playing things and trying to discover it for yourself, you're much less likely to develop this bias, like, oh, these notes are the right notes and these notes are the wrong notes or whatever, because you're just kind of trying stuff and seeing how it sounds. Now, the other uh, serious issue that can happen when you're taking this guided path is that very often the things you'll try, you know, the idea generation part gets limited to what you already have learned. You know, if, if you're just a few months into learning this stuff and you've learned about, you know, major keys or whatever, and you know, you're, you're playing in the key of G major, you're way less likely to try notes that don't fit in this key. You're not likely to play a C sharp or an F natural because it's not part of your key. And so your experimentation part gets very limited. Whereas if you're just experimenting and trying stuff, you're not really limiting yourself, you know, in the same way. So that can be a huge thing too. And you have to realize that just because you don't know what something is, you know, if you don't know that that F is part of the mixolydian mode and that it has these sounds attached to it and you can do these things with it, just because you don't know that yet doesn't mean that you should prejudge that note and say that it doesn't work well. I just realize that, you know, if you play this and you don't understand it yet, you simply haven't learned the name for that or you haven't learned whatever concept describes that note you're playing. But that should never cloud the, the judgment part of what you're doing. So those are, I think, are the two major issues you run into when you're learning theory in the more traditional sense. Now, before you think, well, screw music theory, I'm just gonna do the experimental approach. That sounds way better. Um, there's huge problems there as well. Um, one of the, the biggest issues you run into with the experimental approach, and, and I can think of a uh, specific example. I remember this kid that had come in for lessons. He had played piano for a long time, um, and he was fantastic. He, he, had, he would just sit down and improvise, and he would blow you away. Anyone would be impressed with this guy. Um, and I remember thinking like, what am I going to teach this guy? I mean, he's, he's great. He, he does this better than I can. I mean, what am I supposed to say to him? But if you listen to him, after a while, you start to realize that he would always play in the same key. He would, he really had about 10 or 15 minutes of material that he had kind of worked up and discovered. And everything he did was just that stuff and like little variations and, and whatever. And you'd realize like, actually he can't really do much else besides that. And, and this was why he had come to get lessons. He wanted to get beyond this. He knew he was limited. And the reason was that he had evolved in this very natural way where he had just played stuff and tried it and tried to see how it sounds. And he, you know, would learn that, okay, you know, this note sounds like this and this note sounds like that. And he would put together these little chords and relationships and scales based on, you know, this note sounds this way and this note sounds this way. And without even realizing it, he was, I think it was C minor. He was playing everything in C minor. He didn't even, didn't even know that. And so he would sit there and just, just go wild in this key. And you'd say, hey, cool. Can you play that in F minor? And he'd say, what's an F minor? Like, Definitely not. He doesn't even understand what a key is because he's learned in this, this very natural kind of way, but he, without realizing it, learned the, the simplest way of identifying something. And if he had had someone there saying, no, actually, this note sounds this way because it's, it's this far away from your root note. And, you know, if you moved your root note somewhere else, then, you know, now this note is going to sound that way and learn things in this more relational sense, he wouldn't have gotten stuck like that. And, and there's all kinds of subtle ways that that issue will come up along that experimental path. You know, you'll learn things not necessarily in the best way because you really don't know what the best way is, you're just discovering it. And then another issue that, that can happen is that very often, you know, there are, there are certain things that are very hard to discover on your own, just experimentally, you know, some particularly weird chord that really only works if it leads into another chord, you know, think like, like secondary dominance or that kind of thing. Like, unless you really have a sense of what to do with this weird sound, it doesn't work well. And it's very hard to just randomly discover a weird chord that, that doesn't sound right. And then randomly discover that if you go to this other weird chord, it, it all kind of works. So that stuff can be really hard to discover on your own. 
And you'll see this happen a lot for a lot of like, you know, different pop artists or, or, or groups, you know, you can tell that they've evolved very naturally in their music. And most of the songs that they write are pretty much all in the same key. They pretty much use the same chords and they're all, they're kind of stuck into this style. And they, they might be fine with that. That's not necessarily bad, but you can very easily see that that's a limitation of the way they've, they've learned music. Okay, so here's, I think, what, what all this means to you. We'll get to the practical part of this discussion thing. I assume that if you're watching this video, especially if you're still watching this video, you're, you're looking to further your music. You're trying to be a better musician. And I'm kind of simplifying this a little bit or, or maybe exaggerating. You know, I'm saying that there's these two paths, but in reality... If you're taking the experimental path, there's no way to be completely isolated. Like, of course you're going to learn some of the basic theory concepts. I mean, if someone just said, hey, check out this chord, you would realize like, oh, I think a chord is a bunch of notes that you play together. Or if you went to your grandma's house and watched Sound of Music, you would learn what the major scale is. I mean, it's, when people say, I don't know any theory at all, they're exaggerating. It would be it would actually be harder to avoid learning this stuff because if you're spending time around music, you're gonna pick up some of this stuff. And on the other hand, if you're taking the more guided approach, of course you're gonna experiment and try stuff. I mean, how crazy would it be to sit down at a piano for hours and hours and never try just playing something to see what happens? So there's, there's really no such thing as these two isolated things. There's really a spectrum. You're gonna fall somewhere between this more taught, guided, approach to things or this more experimental and where you are is something you, I think you should reflect on a lot and realize that there are pitfalls in either direction you know if you're being taught theory if you're watching my stuff or you know reading books or whatever realize that you need to spend a lot of time with your fingers on the keys learning things for yourself it's easy to not do that and you need to be very careful that the things you learn don't get into the judgment part of things or you're not judging music because it's not something you understand or you think that it it doesn't make sense quote unquote theory wise it, whereas if you're taking the experimental approach realize that you could end up being very limited in ways that you don't even realize you know you could be learning something and making good progress but that could actually hurt you a lot down the road because you've learned something in a way that's not going to expand very well and disregard all the stupid things that that people like to say um you know you, you'll see people say stuff like you know oh good musicians learn the rules great musicians ignore all the rules or whatever i hate that that thought or that comment it, it means that that person really does not understand what music theory is trying to do or what it's actually there for um so realize your limitations and um I would say typically head towards the center. I think that's usually the best place to be. Learn theory, but also experiment and discover things. And if you find something that you don't really have a theoretical name for, be okay with that. Um, so this turned out to be a little longer than I had expected. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, but I know there's lots of things that I haven't really talked about or touched on. So feel free to expand this stuff or share your thoughts whether you're a teacher or a student or whatever, you know, in the comments. Um, anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks to all my patrons for making this video happen. If, if you want to help out with that, check out my Patreon. You can help, help support the channel. Um, we'll be back soon with something a little bit more typical of this channel, something I'll, I'll, I'll teach you some, some theory. But this is, I think, really important, very important to me. Um, so something to think about. Anyway, I will see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.